a win. Can we start with a win? I want to know. I want to hear about something awesome. Like I got a out. couple wins. Arsha, yeah, step up. Let's go. Um, so I started sending the books. Um, I had my first agent meeting this last Thursday. He did fifteen million a year. Um, and he said he's going to work with us. We have a fall appointment set in January. And then I have a meeting with a broker that has 22 agents today in 30 minutes. Woo! So right. the books, dude, we've been scripting. My brother. <laughs> yeah, we've been scripting three times a week. And yeah, dude, the books are killing it. I mean, I, I, I have some follow-up calls. Um, so I'm excited. You know, I got some calls to make today, but the books are... They're good. And the scripting is just helping out a lot. Nice. So you guys are doing scripting practice then? Yeah, three times a week. Guys, I'm, I'm just going to tell you that when I was learning to do a high trust interview, I practiced over and over and over. You know, I'd grab another loan officer, my wife, I'd make her act like a realtor and um, try to derail me. And I practiced and practiced and practiced until it really just became second nature for me until it was intuitive. Um, and if you can get to that point, then you're going to be unstoppable. So that's awesome to hear that you guys are are doing scripting practice. The scripting made a difference, honestly. I feel like it just gave me that confidence I needed because even my brother, he was in the other room and he just heard me and he walked in after and he's like, dude, he's like, you sound so good. I was like, yeah, I've been practicing three days a week. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. We're literally just learning our lines, you guys. And the one of the biggest um, examples I like to give, you know, are the Academy Award winning actors, right? They don't just show up and wing it on the day that they give their big performance. You know, they they work on those lines until they literally become the character, you know, and, and we're doing the same thing, guys. I mean, we're, we're practicing lo these lines until it's intuitive for us and becomes who we are, you know, and then um, when we get in front of agents, it, it's really hard to say no, because we sound so good. And when we're in front of them, if that makes sense. Uh, Cody, I got a, I got another win courtesy of you. Let's hear it, David. All right, so something that really I really took home, I'm living to it, and I've been experiencing experiencing it is the I make a living from from X to X, but I make a fortune from this to this, right? Ah, and yes. so I actually just came back. I actually flew back out because of a conversation that stemmed from that same conversation um, when we're when we're out in Texas. So I flew back out, made a met a couple agents in a different um, area than mine, and I and in the in the day. I was with them essentially, right? With a, with a group of them. And uh, and then later that evening, I by chance, I went to go see my father and I seen a friend that I hadn't seen in 20 years. And it, it was just a smaller world than I thought. And I said, hey guys, shot them a picture. And I was like, this is, this, this I learned this, that we make a living from X to X, but right now I'm making a fortune. And uh, we have a, a ginormous 2023 um, in the making because of it. I, uh, uh, I took a lot out of it. And one thing I'm absolutely committing to is being intentional and the time blocking. And, and I have to say this, guys, this has been the most productive 13 business days that I've had in my entire life. Um, I, I, I felt, you know how we always, we feel things are going, things are moving, we have a tsunami coming. So whatever's um, after a tsunami, if there's such a thing, that's what's coming, guys. That's what's coming. And uh, thank you, High Trust. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Wally. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, uh, everybody that was out there. So ginormous I'm super I'm jumping out of my skin for 2023 20, 20, to, to, to uh, come to terms yeah this 90 day burn is going to be awesome anybody else who else has a win that we can share before we get into questions I'll give two quick ones um, I'd love to hear it I, I one of my uh, uh, things that I wanted in my five things was to start one timing and so I cut a uh, four legs of the lending chair video and I've got it up on my uh, YouTube site and my website. And uh, oh, okay. we're going to tackle the loan estimate week and get another one timer up there. But I also had a meeting with one of uh, my primary partners uh, for the past 12 months. And I used the lost lead conversation with her. And uh, she's committed to send, she averages, she figures three to four clients that fall through the cracks a week or a month. And so for the next 90 days or for the last 90 days, she figures there's 10 to 12 people that she didn't follow up with. And she's going to have those to me by the first year. So we can follow up for her. Love it. Start building that database. Guys, most of the real estate agents that we're going after are individual agents. 
They're doing all the work on their, on their own, okay? They're making all their sales calls, they're processing okay. their files, they're going to the inspections. And so one of the things I pitch to agents is, look, let us become an extension of your sales team, okay? Now, I, I've got a team of five people that work with me, but um, even when I was a one-man show, you know, I let them know that I have disciplined time blocks every day that I'm making prospecting calls and would love to spend some of that time calling on people that maybe you haven't been able to get through to or need to follow up with so that I can cross sell you. Okay. That's, that's called adding value right there, guys. Help a realtor to convert a deal and you will win their business. I'm heading to my second laser appointment. All right, cool. So, um, all right. Let's 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 switch tracks here a little bit. Um, I want to hear from someone that's getting their butt kicked on something, or struggling with some part of this. Let's let's get on here and talk through it and see if we can help you to work through that. Is anybody struggling with getting anything implemented, or have questions about any any part of what we learned? Cody, do you see Mark? Mark Hensley has a question. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, Mark, go ahead. Hey, Cody. Good morning. Hey, so when you do your high trust sales interview, uh, say with a team leader, what is your follow up process with the team members themselves? Yeah, That's the part question. I'm struggling with right now. Um, I've got a couple of team leaders that I've talked to and they kind of don't want me talking to their team, but I'd like to get to know them a little bit. Um, are you just, would you say a group setting one on one? What's your process there? Well, my first red flag is that the team leader doesn't want you to meet their realtors. It's not that they don't want me to meet them. They don't want me to meet them. They want to maintain control of their team is kind of the, the vibe I'm getting from them. They don't want me to come in and disrupt that specifically by talking to them all individually, like on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, they want more of a, a group setting. Um, so anyway, I, I just wondering if you could just tell me what your process for follow up regardless, and maybe I can take some notes from that. Absolutely. Um, so my approach on that is I'm going to ignore the team lead. Okay. Now you, you got to be careful. You can't disrespect them. Okay. But, um, and, and I want to back up. One of the most powerful positions of influence, you guys, is to be in a, in a classroom environment. Okay, like you guys think about Todd up in front of us at High Trust Sales Academy. Like that is one of the most influential positions a person can be in. Okay, so anytime I get an opportunity to talk to a group of agents, I will always take that opportunity. Okay, and I'll, I'll share a, a secret of mine. When I get up, I've basically taken the High Trust interview and I've adapted it for a group setting where I'm speaking to a group of people. OK, and it might sound like me getting in front of this group of people and saying, you know, introducing myself. And, you know, every time I get together with a group of agents like this, I like to ask questions about what matters to you guys. So let me just ask what's important about the lender that you work with. Right. And then I throw it to the crowd and I start waiting for answers. The realtors will talk. OK, their salespeople like us. They'll talk. And we just kind of start this group conversation. Right. And once we're done with that, I hit a presentation about who I am and what I can do for them, um, just like I would with a regular real estate agent. Um, and I conclude that little talk or that little speech. Um, I'm not going to leave there without a list of the agents in the room. Okay. And that, that presentation that I did is my reason to connect with them on the follow-up. Okay. And I'm going to individually go after every single agent in that room, just like a sniper, picking them off one at a time. Okay. I'm going to write a letter that says, hey, it was so good, you know, meeting you at such and such as wow. group event. Um, somebody yelling. I, I'm going to tell them that I, it was great meeting you at this group event and use that as my reason um, to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them um, to talk about starting a business relationship. So anytime we're in a group environment, that should be the excuse to go after each individual agent after that. Awesome. Appreciate it. That's basically exactly what I'm doing. In fact, I have another meeting here in about 45 minutes with one of those team members. So uh, good to hear that that's what you're doing as well. So I'll keep doing yeah. that too. Thank you. You bet. The book and the letter, you guys, um, the book and the letter approach um, is a sales system that I run. My originators run that. And we just need an excuse to send somebody a letter in a book. You know, if we're at an open house and we meet a realtor, boom, they're getting a letter in a book. 
If we're at a realtor event and we meet someone, boom, they're getting a letter and a book. Great meeting you and chatting with you at this event. I can tell just based on our conversation that, you know, we share a lot of values, we think alike, and would love to set up a time to discuss starting a business relationship. I'm going to piggyback off of that, Cody. I will tell you guys, there's no lenders that does that. And I will tell you, there's a lot of lenders that want to talk to me that they, no one does that. Be the one that sends out. By the way, no one's doing it in your market either. Okay. Unless they're on this call with us, right? There's so little competition because the other loan officers are doing the show up and throw up. That's how they sell. That's not how we roll. Um, and so just the approach letter and book will differentiate itself. Sorry, guys, I forgot that one of my actual real estate agents was on this call. <laughs> I better be careful. <laughs> Thank you, Eleanor. I appreciate that. All right. Good question so far, guys. Let's keep it rolling. Uh, Ricky, you have a question? Two-part question. Um, I'm stumbling a little bit practicing the high trust interview. Done it with real estate friend, a realtor friend of mine, a couple of uh, escrow officers. Um, and the feedback I've gotten is, why are you asking me again? You know, what's important about that to you? Or or tell me more about that. They're like, I kind of told you everything I meant, you know, feel about this. So I'm, I don't want to like press for the same thing where they feel like I'm asking a repetitive question, but I'm trying to go deeper. Yeah. So that's question number one. What do you do about that? Or how do I fix that? And question number two is um, I'm meeting with a uh, realtor who I've known through my Rotary Club for a very long time. We're good friends, but I've never asked for her business. Shame on me. And I'm having that meeting tomorrow. You change or edit since the relationship. I've, I've known her for a long time. You know, do I need to ask some of these same type of questions or do you, do you uh, alter it at all if you know somebody a little bit better going into it? Yeah. So the only thing that I'm going to alter with someone that I've known for a while is the rapport building stage of the conversation. OK, I'm not, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time asking about their kids and their husbands or wives and what they do for fun. And, you know, um, we might just chit chat or whatever. But at some point, we're going to get down to the business, you know, and the business part of the conversation for me begins with the needs analysis. You know, and so if I was sitting down with somebody that I knew from Rotary, you know, and we sitting down to have coffee or lunch or whatever that is, um, you know, I would get right into it, you know, we'd chat or whatever. And then uh, I'd say, you know, like, like I mentioned on the phone, you know, we've known each other forever, but um, we've never had a, a real business relationship like I have with my other partners. I'm very interested in working with you. I like you. Um, and I think that life's too short to do business with people that you don't like, you know? So with that being said, you know, when you refer your clients to a lender, what, what matters most to you? What's most important? And then I'm off and running with the high trust interview from there. Um, that's, that's how I'd handle that situation. Now, back to what you were asking about with going deeper on what's important to you. I think it's important to spend time planning your questions. Okay. That you're going to ask the agents and the conversations are always going to go kind of the same, you know? So if, if I ask a realtor, what's important to you nine times out of 10 guys start tracking this. It's hilarious. Nine times out of 10. The first thing out of their mouth is going to be something having to do with communication. Okay. Um, it might sound in the beginning like, I just want someone to take care of my customers. Okay. Well, tell me more about that. What does that mean to you? Well, I need someone that'll communicate at a high level. Okay. Um, totally understand that. Um, you know, on a scale of one to 10, like how, how good are most of the loan officers that you deal with? Do you feel that communication is something that's lacking in the industry? You know, just kind of a general question. Um, and they'll talk about themselves or whatever. And I may pose the next question like, you know, let me ask you this. Whenever you do have a bad communicator for a loan officer, how does that impact you? Like, how are you impacted as the professional? Um, notice I'm not asking about the client. I'm asking about them, you know, because that's who I really want to know about. And then they'll talk about, well, it makes me look bad. You know, I look like an idiot. I don't know what's happening. Blah, 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 blah. Um, and so I'm only going to try to go down like one or two layers with them on these questions. Um, I'm not, um, 
you know, the 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 part of the conversation you guys have seen, maybe Todd have, where he's, you know, asking about what's important about success and what's behind that and, you know, kind of going deeper on that deal. Um, I'm not doing that in the business part of the conversation, okay, when I'm asking about what's important about the lender, okay? That's a very special setup. It happens during the rapport building part of the conversation. And it's when I'm asking them about their goals, you know, most people don't have goals. So you're kind of rare that you have goals. Why is success important to you? Right. And they'll give you some surface answer like, hey, I want to, you know, do my best. And I'm like, OK, well, why do you want to do your best? What's behind that? You know, um, I want my, my children to see me. Why is that important to you? Well, my dad wasn't around. I didn't have that when I was a kid. You know, that's where you you know, can kind of get deep with someone, but you have to be careful with that because it'll sound weird if you don't have the right rapport with people, right? So we need to be able to sense when it's an appropriate time to ask that and when it's not appropriate. Um, and it's really going to depend on, you guys know what it's like when you get with someone and you you totally vibe in with them, you know, and when it's going to be okay to have that kind of a conversation um, because you're probably going to think alike and talk alike and have the same interests and stuff like that. But um so just to clarify, when I'm doing the needs analysis and I'm asking about what matters most to the lender, I'm only trying to go down one or two layers there, okay? And the whole purpose of that is um, a couple of things. It, it lets them know that I'm actually listening to what they're saying and synthesizing it into new questions so that I can go deeper with them and have more understanding, if that makes sense. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Guys, you could keep jumping in. Mercy, I see you have your hand raised. Yep. Hi. I think I have uh, two questions. My first one is um, in our workbook, there's a like a realtor questionnaire, and there's a lot of questions in that questionnaire. And I was wondering how, at, at what point do you utilize that questionnaire with your realtors and or, or how have you used that in your process? Yeah. So um, I think that you're referring to what we call the gap analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and it, let's say that I meet with a real estate agent and maybe they're a younger agent, been in the business a year, just kind of getting their feet underneath them. Well, when I have a new salesperson, like I've got a lot of value that I can add to them, right? Because I'm a personal development junkie. Um, I'm a successful salesperson. Um, I've learned a lot of lessons. And so I already know that I'm gonna be able to add value to these people. And so um, after I did my high trust interview, um, we might be be talking and and naturally in those conversations, like I'll start talking about things that have helped me in my career, you know. Um, and when I see that they have an interest in that, then I might invite them into my office to do that gap analysis with them. OK, um, and I'll use it under the guise of, hey, come in to my office. Let's sit down and talk about how we're going to refer each other. I've got some specific scripting I want to share with you that's been really, really successful for my other partners. OK, and then as part of that, you know, I'll share that and maybe have that gap analysis with them. Say, hey, I want to sit down and ask you some questions about your business. And, um, you know, this may actually help you um, think about how you can be better at what it is that you do. And so I'll ask them those questions. Um, I've also seen loan officers just give them deliver the gap analysis and say, hey, let's meet. OK, I want to do some business planning. And I do have business planning meetings with my partners, you guys, at least once a year. Like just these last few months, I've had tons of one-on-one -on -one meetings with my realtors where I'm sitting down and helping them to, to set their own goals because some of them don't know how to do that. So I'll take them through an exercise on how to set goals. Um, part of it may be the gap analysis, okay, so that we can see what they need to be working on in their business. Mm -hmm. So anytime there's an opportunity um, for you to add value to an agent and they're growth-minded, right? They want to be successful. They're just like us. You know, they're trying to be successful in their business. Um, give them that gap analysis. Say, hey, golly, got this from my friend Todd Duncan. And I did this for myself. Rocked my world. Okay. You have to do this. Check this out. Let me know what you think. Let's get together and talk about it. So that's, um, that's how I would use the gap analysis. Okay. Thanks. And then on my second question with the, bar, like a, having a borrower and you're going through your, your process when the, your realtor refers that um, person to you, that buyer to you. Um, 
do you just set up that face to face or do you have like a pre qual conversation over the phone with them first? That's your initial. Is that how the flow looks? You have that initial pre qualification conversation over the phone and then you set up and you you kind of go through the process of filling out an application and um, yeah. and let's, then go into the face to face or. Yeah. So let's let's talk about this for a second. Um, the first thing is, is I don't want to get, and I don't, I'm fine talking about my personal process, but there are a million ways to be successful at this part of the process. Um, however, I do believe that there are some common things that happen with the best of the best, okay? And I know this is inside of my organization and outside of my organization, okay? So for me, I'm highly aggressive, you guys. Like, I'm not the loan officer you want to compete against. I promise you that. I will take your lunch money every time, okay? And I train my realtors. I train them how to talk. I help them with their scripting. Like, if you guys hear Eleanor Lee Jenning, you're going to hear my language coming out of her mouth because I've trained her on my scripting, and she knows it works. She knows she's going to sell more houses if she delivers stuff a certain way. Um, I want her to give me a name and a phone number as soon as possible. I don't want her to cross sell me. I don't want her to say anything. Just Cody's going to give you a call and he's going to help bring everything into sharp focus. Okay. So that I can help you get the right home at the right price. She's going to deliver her script. I'm going to call myself or I've got a team member that also helps me to take applications. Um, we're going to start aggressively calling and sending them text messages, trying to connect. When we get them on the phone, we take an initial application. I don't push people to a website, you guys, because my competition does that. And while they're waiting for the client to apply online, I'm taking their lunch money. I've already got the application, right? I've already got a consultation set and the other guy's sitting around waiting. So if you're doing that, I recommend that you not do that. You're going to lose out to people like me. All right. Um, so we get an initial application. It's not a one hour conversation for me. Okay. It's very. Um, uh, surface level for that first conversation. And the reason why, guys, is I'm not going to spend an hour on someone with a 498 FICO. Okay. Not going to happen. My time is too valuable to spend with people that don't qualify. All right. Um, so I'm going to have a very brief conversation and I'm going to explain to them um, these are the next couple of steps in the process. Right. I'm about to send you this email with the list of things I need to get from you. We're going to process this initial application and we'll be right back in touch to get a time set up for us to go through numbers together. Sound okay? They'll be like, yeah, sounds great. So um, from there, you know, we, we're running AUS, all the things you guys do, right? Mm -hmm. okay? I'm checking the credit. We're doing all the things. I'm still a loan officer, all right? Everybody remember that. Um, and we're immediately right back in touch and we're trying to set, schedule um, a face-to-face -face or a phone consultation with them, all right? Whatever, whatever the situation is for them. Now, we used to, pre-pandemic, we would meet with everybody face-to-face. -face. We almost demanded it. Matter of fact, we did demand it. And the reason we did that is we thought that the face-to-face -face, uh, meeting would stop uh, the shopping, okay, the rate shopping. That's what our belief was. What we found out during the pandemic is it wasn't the face-to-face, -face, okay? It's the strength of the referral from Eleanor down here, okay? That's what stopped them from shopping is because she was saying, this is the guy. Right. This is who I trust my family with and who this is who we're going to be working with. So the way that you're referred is super important, guys. Don't let your realtors say things like call Mercy to see if she can get you a better deal. That's not acceptable because that sets us up for a situation where we're in a price war with another lender. Um, not interested in that. OK, I'm not interested in working with a realtor that needs to refer me that way. I'll fire them for that. OK, what I what I want is for the realtor to say, listen, Cody is one of the top mortgage bankers in the state of Oklahoma. And whether you decide to work with him or not, a brief conversation with him could completely change the trajectory of this transaction. It's the only person I trust my family and my clients with. He's the best of the best. I know he's going to take care of you. That's how I want to be referred. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, did I answer your question, Mercy, or do you want to follow? Yes. On? No, no, that's good. Thank you. OK, cool. Aaron. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, uh, coming in today, Cody. I appreciate you. Good to talk uh, to you, Aaron. 
I, I've got a little bit of a cold, so I apologize if I cough and sneeze while I ask my question. Good. Um, I'm struggling with uh, CRM implementation. And my question for you, Cody, is if you're, I'm, I'm a small shop, uh, I've got a full-time assistant, and I'm thinking about hiring another person just to help manage the client database. I've been in business for 17 years, got probably 3,000 clients. Uh, I want to figure out how to re-engage and CRM is top of my mind. What three things would you do? What three steps could you run me through real quick that comes off the top of your mind to make that happen and make that work? Yeah. So uh, database is, is such an important part of my business. You guys, um, early on, my business was 95% from realtor referral. Um, and now it's 40% realtor referral, 60% database. Um, my, my database of unique clients is about that same, uh, number somewhere in the 3,500 to 4,000 range. And number one, what's important is that you start and never quit that marketing to your database ever. Okay. Number two, I want to know the buying timeline of every customer in my database. Okay. I want to share a secret with everybody on here. Everyone on this call has a goal to buy a home of some sort, okay? Even if you're in your like dream home, okay? Like I'm in my dream home, but I've got a goal to buy all kinds of houses because I'm an investor, okay? I've got a dream of buying a house in, in St. Thomas, man, right? So like even I have some goals out there. Everybody has a goal to buy a home and it's our job to know where our clients are on their buying timeline. And when we close a loan for them, they begin the next buying timeline, okay? And if it's not them, it's their it's their uh, sphere of influence that's gonna buy and they're gonna refer to you. And so I do believe that discipline is one of the most important, or I'm sorry, that databasing and marketing to our database is one of the most important disciplines that we can have. Um, and, and it's almost, I mean, it's as important as, as calling on our realtor agents um, to get referrals. It's calling our database to check in. And honestly, it's a much easier sales call Matter of fact, it's the easiest sales call you can make is to your own clients who already know, love, and trust you, okay? But if you don't call, they're not thinking about you guys. And so number two, number one is to start and never stop, right? Number two is knowing where all of my clients are on their buying timeline. Like that's a massive mountain to climb for you to contact 3,500 or 3,000 people and find out where they are. I'm telling you, Darren, you will be kicking yourself because here's what's going to happen. You're going to start calling. Some people are going to be like, hey, I'm never moving. I'm here forever. Right. But then some of the people are going to say, you know what? Crazy, you called. I'm painting my master bedroom right now. I'm going to list in two months. I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to need all the loans I can get in two months. So those calls are important. The reason I know that, guys, is because I do have a full time client concierge that works for me. And her whole world is just calling and connecting with my database to tell them, number one, we haven't forgotten about you, okay? Number two, we care about you, right? Um, and then number three, we want to talk to the people that you care about, okay? One of the one of the scripts that she delivers to every client is, is there anybody that's close to you that could benefit from talking with us, okay? You guys listen to what I just said. Is there anybody that's close to you that could benefit from speaking with us? That sounds and feels a lot different than who do you know that needs to borrow money or who do you know that needs to buy a refinance right now, right? And I'm, I'm asking them a specific question. I only want to talk to the people that are close to you that you think could benefit from speaking with me. And the referrals don't typically happen on the phone, guys. What we're doing is we're strategically placing ourselves in the reticular activating systems of our clients' minds. We're, we're strategically placing ourselves in the top of mind. Okay, so they're not going to have someone right then. It's going to be a week later when they talk to their cousin's daughter that's buying a house. Oh, you need to talk to my guy, Cody. Psh, amazing. But if I hadn't made that call the week before, I wouldn't have been top of mind. They wouldn't have thought about me. They wouldn't have referred me. So those are those are my three quick ones, Darren, is to start, never stop. Find out where you are on the buying timeline. And make sure that you're soliciting referrals on every call. Excellent. You, thank, thank you. Yes, sir. One last thing. If you guys don't ask, you won't get. 
okay? We have to tell our people that we want referrals from them, right? And we can be magical about how we phrase it, um, but we have to let them know that we want referrals from them. Semper Fi. Hoorah. Thank you, sir. All right, who's next? Catherine Barnett, I see your hand up. Catherine. Hey, Cody, how are you? Good. Thanks for doing this. I have what I feel is like a petty question for you. No such um, thing. And it, it piggybacks off, I think it was Mercy's question about the application side of things. And I'll be honest with you, I just, in my 20 years of doing this, I don't ever want to take an application again, but I do see the value of that. And the problem I run into as a broker owner is the strictness of credit pools without an electronic authorization. So getting that verbal, we used to get like mother's maiden names. Now they have to use a certain technology through an app in order to record the authorization um, or a, a specific kind of DocuSign type app. And that's the only thing my vendor will accept. That's a bummer. I know. So I have them, I have them go online. I don't think I lose a lot of leads. I, I probably lose more of the crappy leads than anything else. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'm sure there's occasions where they've started an application and they haven't finished it. But you know, I've also thought about, hey, I'll just do it for them over the phone. Yep, I can't do that either. Um, I would be figuring something out. Okay. okay. I, and, and I know everybody's different. Okay. I'm gonna tell you that I would not work in that environment personally, um, because I need that, I personally need that control piece. You know, and I already know that there's other things that companies do that are totally acceptable from a regulatory standpoint. I want to be careful about talking about regulatory stuff here, but um, I know that um, verbal authorizations happen every single day on credit pools. Yeah, I used every to be able, day. I used to be able to do it with them, but the past two credit agencies I've worked with, they've audited me. And I've, I, I think I've gotten by by the skin of my teeth, to be honest with you. And so now I'm like, I don't want to risk that. It. Yeah, I don't blame you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't I don't blame you there. Um, lots of credit repositories out there. I use Credit Plus. Okay. Oh, I mean. I may just, I may look around then. A verbal, uh, there, there's companies that are okay with the verbal auth. I mean, I put in, I get it from my client verbally. I put in um, a, their phone number that I, that I spoke with them on, you know, and I don't pull people's credit unless I have permission. Um, right. You're good as long as you, the only time you're ever gonna have an I guess I've never been audited by someone like that. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh, uh to have to deal with that as a broker. And I'm I I'm work for an independent correspondent, so I don't they deal with all that stuff for me. But um yeah, that would be a challenge. That would be a challenge for me. Okay. okay. Just because of how I do business and how I feel about about the web apps, you know. Yeah. I get I get web apps, it's just and maybe it's just because I'm an aggressive high D personality. Like I want to do it and do it right now. And the bigger piece for me guys is that when I take that app over the phone, like I'm forcing them into my sales process, right? I'm not waiting for them to get around to it whenever they're ready or whatever. Um, and when they're in the sales process, they feel like, I okay, good. I can go to the next thing now, right? I've got that part handled for the day. I'm going to go back to work or the next thing. I've got this handled. Yeah. So, I, like I said, I don't lose a lot. And I, I've, yeah. I've changed my scripts to where through my calendar, it, it kind of moves that through the same process that I would have normally done on an application. And then I do a consult, consult with them. But I am, you know, checking, I am probably talking with them probably one more time than I need to, but I still feel like I'm developing a relationship. It's just the, it's the whole credit pool that I might need to solve for. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Like I said, it was petty. <laughs> it was like operational. So. Um. No, it's not, you know, that's a, that's a regular question that I would get from one of my originators. So thank you for speaking up. All right. Thank you. Charlene Scott. Hi, Charlene. Hi, Cody. Um, first of all, you're making me feel lazy because I always send a link out to my application. So I am going to try and work on that. Um, 
But you were talking about uh, realtors that don't follow up with their clients and mentioning that we could become an extension of their sales team. How would you, uh, could you share what you would say in that conversation with that buyer? Um, with a buyer? Yeah, like, because you were talking about our, our calling the realtors, like the realtors not keeping in touch with their buyers or their people that they're working with. Yeah. Is that who you're following up with? Well, I'm talking about their prospects. Okay. Right. Yeah. So in, or, in order for them, um, in order for me to call them, they're going to have to give me their contact information. Right. So I have a referral now. Okay. Right. <laughs> I'm going to call my own referrals and I'm going to call aggressively until they tell me to go away or they apply. Um, <laughs> so it, my scripting with those people is the same scripting that I would use with any prospect. You know, and if you guys don't, I, I'll share it with you. And it's it's the script that I use is so hokey, you guys. OK, it's so hokey, but so effective. OK, because I use what's called an education based sales process on this initial onboarding script. And it's highly, highly effective. OK, if you guys sat and listened to me take apps all day, you'd hear the exact same script over and over. Why? Because it works. Right. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. This works. So who wants to role play? Charlene, you're gonna let's have you watch. Ryan, you're right in my face, dude. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make you role play with you. Will you do it? Oh, I'm game on, brother from okay, Canada. You, you be the prospect, I'll be the loan officer. Okay. Um, hey Ryan, this is Cody Hardridge with Cornerstone Home Lending. How are you? I'm well, Cody. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, I was referred to you by Eleanor Hutton um, with the Boone team, and she said that you are looking to buy a home right now. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, she's a fantastic person. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, um, she asked me to connect with you about getting started on loan prequalification. And if it's okay with you, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my process. And then afterwards, you can tell me if you think that'll be helpful. Totally. Let's Great. dive in. So, yeah. So what we typically do is we'll get some basic information for the application. And you and I can do that in three to five minutes here on the phone. We're going to process the initial application. And then we're going to call you back to set up a time uh, to have a consultation with me. And during that meeting, I'm going to help you bring all of the numbers into sharp focus so that you're clear about the price point that we need to be looking at to achieve the monthly payments that you want, the different program options, and how much money you're going to need. And my goal with that is to make sure that you have all the information that you need to make a good financial decision for you and your family. Does that sound like something that would be helpful? Yes, very much so. Thanks. All right. Fantastic. Is Ryan your legal first name? Yes, sir. Boom. And I'm taking the app, you guys, just like that. I've got my web app in front of me and boom, I just start taking it right there. So what I did there, you guys, um, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I used a couple of tie down questions. Um, I went into the conversation. I said, Eleanor said, you're looking to buy a home. Is that correct? Okay. And right then the client's either going to say, yep, that's right. Or they're going to say, well, we're not really ready yet. Or we're just kind of shopping around, seeing what the markets, you know, we're not sure regardless of what, what they say, it lets me know where they are, okay, and how I may need to, to treat the conversation, okay? Um, so, for instance, if somebody says, well, we're, we're really not wanting to buy until next year, okay, I'm going to modify my scripting a little bit and just say, hey, I want to give you all the information that you need to guide your thinking between now and then, okay, instead of making a good decision right now. Um, but I might just tweak my scripting just a little bit for their situation. Um, but it's also going to let me know if I'm going to have any troubles with them or any objections that are going to come up that need to be dealt with. An anchoring uh, question. Yeah. And then I just tell them what we're going to do, guys. It's the same thing y'all do. I'm going to take an application and I'm going to set a meeting with you. Right. And then I talked about three things that I'm going to help them do. I'm going to help them understand the price point they need to be looking at to achieve the monthly payments they want which by the way, is the number one thing that all of our people want, right? Everybody wants to know that. Can I afford this house, right? I know what I want. Can I do the payment? Like, I think that's the number one thing that we do with people. Um, I'm going to talk to them about the different loan programs, okay? Because I know my competition's only talking about one thing. They're only going to put one thing in front of them, right? Okay. And then I'm going to talk to them about how much money they need. That's the other question everybody has the questions about. And then I use a power phrase, guys. Todd talked to us about power phrases, didn't he? I said, I'm gonna, my goal is to give you all of the information that you need to make a good financial decision for you and your family. That is a power phrase, the whole thing. Highly, highly effective, guys.
Charlene, did I answer your question? You did. Thank you so much. You are welcome. And don't you're not you're not being lazy just by sending those links out. Okay. Lots of people do that. It's okay. I send links out too. Okay. If I can't, if I let's say like if I call someone and they're like, yes, I want to do this, but I'm like, I just stepped out of a meeting um to take your call. Like, can we great? I'm gonna send you a link too. Right. I'm gonna try you back after five, but I'm gonna go ahead and send you a link in case it's easier for you to apply that way. I don't want anybody to think that I don't send uh, links to my website because I get tons of apps that way um, for people that are referred in and like I never get them. The realtors say, here, go to this website and apply. But my goal is to take it over the phone. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Ryan, are you up? Yes, sir. What's your question, sir? So on the note of like the client journey, which we're talking about, and I've really taken a lot of time to perfect the client experience from start to finish. Yeah. And just to take away from high trust sales, just want to see like, what is Cody's secret sauce? Like we all do very good at it. We're all in the same room. We're all the top 1% of it loan officers, but sure. what is Cody's like, I guess, sexy little sticky um client journey expectation how do you get that wow how do you make them like feel yes okay you know what i mean like, you're shaking yeah. your head so. yeah um all right okay so this is almost you know like todd sometimes we'll talk about operationalizing trust all right so um i'll just share with you guys some of the things that my client experience team does Okay, notice that I said I have a client experience team. Okay, in my, my organization, I want to be careful here. It don't sound like I'm like trying to bash or recruit or any of that kind of stuff, because that's not. I'm just telling you how it is. Um, I have a client experience team that serves all of my loan officers. Um, we use a CRM called Whiteboard CRM, which is a communication platform. And that CRM tells my client experience team when to do certain things during a transaction, okay? Um, you can do this on a smaller level, okay? I'm, I'm talking about doing this for 24 origination teams over three states. Um, but when somebody takes an application for me, they're gonna get a handwritten letter, hand signed. I'm sorry, it's a typed letter that's hand signed, but it's not signed by me, okay? My client experience girls, um, they have uh, mastered my signature, okay, with my permission. Said, I don't ever sign one of these again. You guys perfect my signature, and they've done that, okay? So that would be number one. Um, once I go under contract with folks, they're going to get um, a little note from me with a Starbucks gift card. Sit back, relax, have some coffee. Let me worry about your mortgage. You're in good hands, okay? Just a little small something, guys. And I'm going to tell you guys these steps, and then I'm going to explain the science behind it. Once we get the appraisal, know that the deal is going to be good. We have something that we call a congrats pack that goes to the client. It's totally hokey, you guys. Like the most expensive thing in the box are the custom or the are the gourmet cookies, okay? That we buy to put in there. Everything else is like markers, um, packing tape. Uh, box labels, important phone numbers for wherever they're moving. Totally hokey, right? Guys, it's a game changer. Uh, it, I can't tell you how how many times it's impacted the way a client feels about me and my team, okay? Um, and then once the transaction's over, uh, we do send a closing gift. It's a, a PSA Essentials is the name of the company. Super cool um return address stamps for our clients okay now that's part that's one layer right of the experience um the reason that we're sending those things guys is because something of, of something called the law of reciprocity all right and there is something that is ingrained in our evolutionary dna that makes us feel obligated to people when they do something nice for us. And it goes back to the time where we used barter as an economy. Okay, so Ryan, if you're the blacksmith in town and I'm the leather guy, um, I may come to you and say, hey, you know, you needed some new leather bags for your tools, here they are. I created this for you. 
right? And you're going to say to me, Cody, I owe you. I'm indebted to you, Cody, right? You're going to have a hard time saying no to me because I totally did you a solid, man. Does that make sense? So that's a big thing. But like when we met with clients face to face, we would have a, a, a Godiva chocolate in a gift box with the client's name on it, waiting for them in the conference room at their seat. Okay, tiny, tiny little gift, but it triggered the law of reciprocity. It made it harder for them to say no to me or to see me as a bad guy or I'm a sales guy or someone that they need to be worried about. It impacted the way they feel about me, okay? So the, the other piece, guys, is we communicate at a super high level, all right? Now, our clients are never wondering what's going on or what the next step of the process is. And that's because we have developed scripting throughout our process, whether it's me or one of my team members, we deliver the scripting and we tell them the next step is, okay? The next step of the process is this, right? So when I'm talking to them and I'm locking their rate or whatever, I'm telling them, okay, we've got that handled. The next step is in the next 24 to 48 hours, you're going to be receiving a set of loan disclosures that reflects all of this in much more detail. Now. When you get that, if you have questions and you'd like me to go through it with you, just give us a call. We'll be happy to walk through that with you, okay? And then from there, our my team members will be in touch with their next steps, okay? And so, like, we have it set up. So, um, like, my closing coordinator who gets all my loan conditions, um, when we start a new loan, she schedules an intro conversation with that client to introduce herself. Right. And she's got her scripting that she goes through that ends with, OK, the next step is. Right. Next step is I'm going to send you this email so that you can send me these three things that we talked about today. OK, anything do you. And once I send this over, um, is there any reason that we can't get this back maybe tomorrow or the next day? She gets a commitment. She sets a timer. She knows when to follow up. So. It's a combination. If you're going to ask me what my, oh, and then the third layer, let me, let me not leave this out. Um, Y'all, I'm really good at doing loans. Like, and I don't, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but like, we're real good. I'll close the loan in eight days from beginning to end with full appraisal, right? Um, my average contract time is probably three weeks or less. Um, all the realtors in town know it. They know that if they see my name on an approval letter, that it means a commission check for them. So um, that's kind of the third layer if you're going to talk about, wow. So when you put all of that together and we're really awesome at doing our loans, we don't make mistakes. Um, we communicate in a world-class fashion and I've got law of reciprocity gifts going out that are going to impact the way they feel. When you put all of that together, it turns into this wow experience. Okay. And and that's why sometimes I'll have clients that come to me and they'll say, listen, um, I know this may sound weird, but I've been referred to you by three people in the last two days. Three different people have given me your name. So apparently I need to talk to you. That's because my clients remember how I make them feel, right? That's the thing that they remember going away from the transaction. I recently had a client call me. Um, I did her original loan 11 years ago. And um, I had made calls to her. I went and checked my CRM, but she had never responded to me um, or to my client concierge. Um, but she called me back. And so I was like, hey, seriously, it's been 11 years. What made you come back to me? She said, I just remember how you guys made me feel on that last deal. I want to work with you again. Now, if you guys sit and think about it, the clients will forget their rates. They'll forget their fees, right? What they will never forget is how we made them feel, right? And that comes from a famous quote by Maya Angelou, who was the poet laureate under President Bill Clinton. And her famous quote is, people will forget what you said, they will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel, okay? And, and that's an important part of my business and my client experience is impacting the way the clients feel about me going away from the transaction. That's why my good friend Linda Davidson says we never close later ugly because she knows that if you close ugly, that's what's going to get remembered going away from the transaction. Gold. Thanks, bud. That answer your question, Ryan? I think we got a lot of 
no takers and head shaking. And yeah, no, that was awesome. Good stuff, guys. Appreciate it. All right, Katie. Hi, Cody. Thank you. That was great information. I took a lot of notes. <laughs> thanks. Um, good to see you. Thanks. You touched on it a little bit, but I want to know how you track your leads, what software systems you're using to make sure the leads don't fall through the cracks. Mm. Um, I think that's yeah. been one of the biggest challenges that I've had in this industry, and I don't think what I'm using right now is best. Okay. So, um, and I want to be careful about pitching products on here. Um, I use Whiteboard CRM, and I'm going to tell you guys a secret, okay? Whiteboard CRM was designed by a gentleman named Brian Bomar, okay? Um, Brian Bomar um, is my former boss, okay? He was my regional president, and he and his wife, number one origination team in Oklahoma where I live, okay? So it's the only CRM in the industry that was designed by a group of top producers, okay? So when we were designing that, like I was, I was the uh, beta test, if you will, on that, um, you know, they were testing it out on me and the other originators that I work with. So that's my pitch for for whiteboard is that it was it was designed by a top producing originator. Sorry, I got an aggressive realtor calling me. Um, now the way that and that it's is, not me. You're cheating on me. What is happening? <laughs> it's Cameron Burke. Okay, that kid's aggressive. I got a realtor, you guys. He's been in the business one year. He closed like 40 deals his first year. You just never know when they're going to, they'll just come out of the woodwork, y'all. Um, okay, so back to tracking leads. Um, the, way that, the way that Whiteboard's set up is there are different kind of, um, oh, uh, phases of the transaction. You know, they got leads, prospects, prequals, applications, funded, credit repair. And so I keep a pipeline, a prospect pipeline. And uh, my business is very systemized. If Eleanor texts me a name and a phone number, I do a screenshot and I forward that in an email to myself and to uh, my team member, Rebecca. And Rebecca's in charge of putting 100% of our prospects into our CRM. The reason we do that is because they know I'm highly flawed. They know I'm highly human. I will forget. I'll miss something. I'll, you know, whatever. I'm always the bottleneck in our business. And so they try to take things out of my hand. So I forward it to them to make sure it goes in. So that's where the discipline is making sure that your people are going in there. Right. And then you need to, you need to have kind of an agreement with yourself about how much and how long you're going to follow up with that client. Okay. Um, there's plenty of people that say you need to make at least 13 attempts before you um, give up on a prospect, right? So when those prospects go in my CRM, yes, I do have a marketing campaign that goes out to them. Um, what I like about Whiteboard is I get to write the scripts and it sounds like it's for me and it works really well. Um, it allows me to text the clients, which we all know that a lot of people like to text. I do not do business on my cell phone. Okay, I asked my realtors not to give my cell phone to the clients, okay, because it, it provides poor customer service because I may be, I spend a lot of time in front of clients and I don't want them to wait. I want them to call my team line. Um, but we're going to start calling and texting these people on a daily basis. And um, at the end of our, our process, which is about 13 attempts, I'm reaching out to Eleanor, hey, We've been calling and texting with zero response of any kind. How do you want me to proceed? And she'll still either say, it ghosted me to forget them. Or she might say, let's keep going. I talked to them last night. They've been sick. They got whatever going on. No problem. As long as you're still going after them, my realtor partner, I'm going to be going after them. So I do think that technology is important to keep yourself organized and make sure that you don't lose leads. And we don't cancel and stop calling someone until our realtor tells us to, to stop. Okay, that's good, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, and also I'll share with you guys, like um, I use a dialer when I'm making calls. 
All right, I use Phone Burner. And that allows me to upload a list of clients and build lists in there. And I can click a button and make 50 calls in a row without stopping. Okay, if you manual dial, you're going to spend 45 minutes dialing and 15 minutes talking. But if you can adopt a dialer technology, um, I like Phone Burner because it's a single dial. Um, then you'll spend 45 minutes talking and 15 minutes dialing. It saves a ton of time and it's a productivity hack. I use it when I call my agent partners. I use it when I call my uh, prospective borrowers. My client concierge uses it too when she's calling the database. Great question. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Wait, let me ask you a question. Where do you struggle on this? Um, a lot of, so I'm in a border town and we have a lot of non-qualified leads. So we get a lot of leads that come in. We have like 25% that can even think of buying a house anytime in the next couple of years, credit, income issues, things like that. So we have a lot of leads that come in that aren't, they aren't viable, right? So those we kind of have to, we, we still give them a plan, you know, to follow. We still care about them. We still give them like, if you follow these steps, you can buy a home in this period of time. So then we kind of need to put those to the side and focus on the ones that are viable leads. Um, but I feel like the, the ones who need three months to, um, you know, raise their credit score or the ones who need to file their taxes in 2023 before they're going to qualify, I feel like our system of making sure that we get stay in touch and get back in touch with them at the appropriate time is where we fall short. Yeah. Um, that is tough. That is tough. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to, I don't want to act like I've got a silver bullet for this. Um, because even my CRM doesn't allow me to organize people the way that I need to for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I've found is to organize those people in one bucket. All right. And that's what we do. Okay. Inside of phone burner, I can have different folders with different contacts. And so we've got um, follow-up folders with different time periods. And my client concierge will get on the phone and she's an animal. You know, she just, she'll call anybody anytime, anywhere. So um, we'll stick them in that folder and she'll call to follow up and she'll read the notes in the CRM about they needed to file their 23 taxes, right? So when she gets to that call and sees that they need 23 taxes and it's January, she's going to skip over that and she's going to come back to them, you know, closer to April 15th mm -hmm. and hit them on that next round. So I don't have a silver bullet for that. It's hard. The only thing I can tell you is to segregate and organize those people mm -hmm. and then form a discipline around the follow-up piece because that is where the fortune is. Right. And Does one your other thing, computer... I do, real quick, I do want to say, I'm sorry, don't go ahead with your question. I was going to say, does your CRM have a way to set a reminder where it sends a reminder email to you if you, if you set it up to trigger you, things like that? Yes, um, whiteboard, we, we can set tasks in there, okay? And Kaylee does do that. She'll set um, tasks for certain times and then she gets a task inside of the uh, CRM that she can then download because you can download the tasks as a list of calls you need to make. Um, she'll upload that into our dialer and, and start dialing. Okay. I've heard people doing this kind of stuff in Outlook and I just, man, that seems dangerous to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I have to take my human out of it because my human will screw everything up. I, right. I try to get some kind of a technology solution that removes me guys because I am such a flawed human, such a flawed human. Um, one other thing I wanted to say, you were talking about your uh, client base. Um, a lot of people that you got to kind of have to put a plan together for and all that. I get plenty of that too. Okay, the reason why is because I've got a lot of aggressive agents like Eleanor that lead Jen like crazy. And she's, and I've told her like the only qualifying factor for me to have a conversation is somebody has to have a goal to buy a home. That's it. If they have a goal, I want to talk to them. Okay. So um, for those kind of people, like, and this includes the turndowns that I have, people with bad credit. Um, I do have a credit analyst. That's kind of wild. <laughs> uh, for, for those, for those people um, that have work to do, we give them an assignment. 
okay? We'll give them an assignment. What's up, Henry? What's up? Y'all check it out. It's my like little godson over here. Um, we'll give them an assignment, okay? And we'll follow up with them one time on the assignment. If they have not done the assignment, they go to cancel, okay? Because we all know that there are a type of people out there that are victims and not players, right? And I don't have time for victims, okay? I need to focus all my time on the players. And what's interesting about the players is that you don't have to follow up with them. They'll go do the assignment, email or text or call you and say, hey, Cody, I got it done. What's next? Yeah. And those are the people we spend time with and follow up with. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Great questions. Anything else you can think of? Appreciate you speaking up. Tom Seaman, you're up. All right, thank you so much. Uh, great session here, Corey. Uh, first of all, the question is, do you adopt realtors databases? And if so, how do you approach that? That's a great question. I personally have not taken a database from one of my clients. Okay, and, and I wanna, there is an important distinction I wanna make here. Um, on a very regular basis, I'll have realtors offer to let me get in their database and just start calling their, their leads and prospects, okay? I don't call leads. I can't call leads, okay? I've tested this uh, myself and a very aggressive team member, um, made thousands of calls. Um, it was back in 2013, 14 for a team we were working with because we wanted to test it. And the conversion was terrible. It was terrible, right? And I spent the first part of my career cold calling for mortgage refinances, y'all. That's a tough way to do business because you got to call someone and get them to trust you on the phone enough to give you their social security number and all their financials, okay? The barrier of entry in a conversation is a lot lower when it's a realtor just saying, you know, hey, you have a goal to buy a home at some point in the future, right? And what I found I have the highest conversion rate on is when I have a, a professional realtor that has converted a lead and uses me as part of their conversion process, okay? By delivering my script, just like I've trained Eleanor to do, hey, if they give her and say, yeah, I've got a goal to buy a home, next thing out of her mouth is fantastic. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have Cody give you a call. He's one of the top mortgage bankers in the state. Whether you decide to work with him or not, He's going to help me bring everything into focus so that I can help you achieve your goal of owning a home. Okay. That is a high conversion situation. Um, but no, I'm not going to market directly to the realtor's database. Okay. Now, if they want to set up some kind of passive marketing, you know, where we're doing some email marketing or something like that, and um, we want to combine ourselves on the same marketing piece, me and the realtor, and it's going to go to all my clients, which actually I can't, I'm not even going to do that. I'll go to their clients, but not to mine. Okay. Cause you got to know that all my clients came from Eleanor. Okay. And people like her and Eleanor's not going to appreciate it. If I put a competitive realtor in front of her clients. So that, that is a problem with that, but I will go onto a marketing piece with them and allow them to put me in front of their database. If that makes sense. And I'm not going to be cold calling their leads. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. You bet. Guys, we got time for one more. Jason, you got your hand up, brother. So you are the winner. All right. Thanks. I, I know we're at the end of the hour, so I'll be quick. Uh, going back to what you were saying about how you engage with your clients um, and you, you do the three things uh, for them. How do you, how do you use uh, video in that? When I, uh, after my first conversation with clients, I'll typically send an email with next steps and I'll throw in a video, uh, you know, just so they can see who I am and I have that personal connection. Do you use that at all? Um, yeah. So I don't, first of all, I think it's highly effective. Okay. Um, one of my loan officers uses video like that. She uses it for her weekly updates. Um, and here's the deal, guys. People believe what they see on TV. Okay. All of us. Um, and so I think it adds a tremendous amount of credibility. Um, the challenge I have with Amber, okay, my loan officer, is the scalability piece. Okay. 
um, because you guys, and I'm going to take out the last three years, y'all. We just can't even count them. But in normal times, I'm closing 30, 40 transactions a month. Okay. I don't have time to cut 30 or 40 individual videos every time I hit a part of the transaction. Does that make sense? I've got to create this streamlined pipeline. So I do have video that goes to my customers on every deal, but it's pushed out by my CRM, right? And it's an intro video, blah, blah, blah. When we hit the next point. There'll be another video that goes out, do's and don'ts, you know, hey, we're at this part. Um, so we use it like that, but um, we're going to couple that with technology so that I don't have to think about it. Because like we talked about, I'm a super flawed human and I just won't do it. I'll just, I'll forget, I'll procrastinate, whatever. So that's how I, that's how I put video into my business. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Y'all, this has been an awesome session. I, uh, I appreciate everybody like jumping on with me today. Totally cool. And I hope you guys got something out of it. Um, if you guys have an individual question, shoot me an email. Okay. I grab my name, Google, like I'm super easy to find. Um, I had a conversation with Chase on here earlier this morning. Um, hit me up. Would love to visit with you. All right. You guys sell well. Have a great day.